Um, today, or this session is going to focus quite on the a lot of demos and uh, some of the architectural archite architectural pattern. I'm evangelist as well with Randall in the team. Uh, I've been using AWS as a customer for about 11 years and with AWS for about two and a half years. And I started as a solution architect working with very large uh, gaming companies and companies in general and, and trying to figure out. And this kind of, this deck is a kind of collection of of architectures and especially uh, patterns that uh, I've seen and are pretty cool. Maybe just not, some of them might be obvious, but some of them I'm sure will challenge a little bit uh, your view of things. And many of those are powered by demos. So get your phone next to you uh, because we'll, we'll need it. Uh, there's a couple of objectives, as I said. Uh, mostly we're going to talk about different kind of patterns on the operation, ev event operation, web and data processing. So four, uh, four architectures, four patterns, and then we'll dwell uh, into those. So some, some key concepts, uh, just, just going very fast. I don't want to, to, to go too much into it, but uh, uh, you've probably seen these slides previously. Uh, what is interesting in this slide uh, is to understand actually the the variance of uh, of things when we talk about manage uh, and, and serverless. Serverless architectures by default uh, are very interesting because they are actually uh, built with availability and fault tolerance right out the get. And this is for me the most important thing. As I say, I'm a cloud architect, so my, my mission number one is actually trying to make the system scale and being highly available and resilient. And you might not know, or maybe it's not obvious, but when we talk about serverless services, under the hood, they are uh, built on top three AZs, AZ availability zones. And each of those AZs are separated by a couple of mil uh, milliseconds. They're actually geographically separated. It can be uh, an AZ can be one data center, but also there are regions where an AZ is a set of data, uh, a cluster of data centers. And each of those regions or all of those AZs are geographically separated. They have different electric, uh, electrical uh, grid, they have different flood plain, different earthquake planes, and things like this. And this for me is really is kind of the bread and butter. Did I start too early? No, oh, it was all right. I see people still coming, sorry. All right, anyway, it's just a, a, a quick reminder. So this is for me really what is really important as an architect. Also on the uh, Lambda function itself, a couple of things to remember. Uh, and while I see customers mm, kind of have trouble with is the event ver uh, object versus the contact object. The event object is the object that is passed between services. I'll, I like to see, for example, Lambda uh, as a message passing system with compute on top of it, right? So you take a service A and B, uh, so for example, you have uh, storage and then you uh, have uh, your UI or you know database or whatever, and then you have a Lambda in between. Lambda is a message, is passing information between two services and add some compute on top of it. And I like to see the systems like this. I really like to see the idea of event-driven architectures. So I think this fits very well in that context. Also, maybe, have you seen these slides already? Yeah? So I just want to focus a couple of stuff here uh, if it was not mentioned. The most important thing here in this slide is to remember that this uh, stream-based versus asynchronous is a matter of uh, order, right? Uh, this preserves order in the stream. This one doesn't, right? And this is very important uh, if you want to uh, uh, do architectures that actually preserve orders of event. You don't have much choices but to move into Kinesis or DynamoDB type of things. And if you don't mind about uh, the order of the events, you can use uh, S3 or SNS and things like this. It's the best effort type of things versus ears really ordered. Okay. A couple of best practice. Uh, again, what I see the most important uh, uh, use environmental variables to pass information is a Lambda function. Uh, there's a lot of problems with customers that, again, hardcore data into uh, Lambda functions. Just use environmental variables so that your deployment pipeline uh, can be uh, much, much uh, cleaner. Also, uh, another important thing, uh, we 
do sometimes update the uh, Lambda ecosystems uh, under the hood. It's Linux containers, our own containers, and we do update it. We patch the operating system, which patch things, which sometimes can affect uh, dependencies into libraries, right? Uh, so when you deploy code, always bring your own dependencies so that you've tested your function with the dependencies that you had uh, locally. Uh, so you create a zip file, and then which has all the dependencies. Of course, it's increasing the size of your package, but you have uh, it's it's still the best practice. And sometimes you have to be careful. You cannot, for example, in Java, uh, bring all the classes. You do need to uh, uh, to to sort them and bring only the ones that you uh, use. All right. If you haven't enabled X-Ray, and especially X-Ray is interesting as soon as you start to use Lambda in large-scale distributed systems, like if you have it all over the place, uh, it's very uh, interesting to enable X-Ray. It will kind of, what it does is allows you to add a tracker ID on the, on the request, on the uh, HTTP header, and then it will follow uh, through the entire life of the request path, right? And then you can analyze in your systems where uh, errors might pass and where your uh, uh, functions are, or when your request is spending time. And you can also figure out uh, the the, uh, the the effect of cold and uh, uh, cold start with your lambda functions. So you can see it. So, uh, uh, as I said, there's many frameworks. Every day I wake up, there's a new framework out there. Uh, I was <laughs> when we when Lambda was launched. Serverless was launched. Uh, it was named JAWS by the by, uh, in 2015. It was rebranded Serverless. So I'm I'm using Serverless a lot when I do projects. Uh, I kind of like it, but uh, uh, every time I do Python APIs, I like Chalice as well. So let's talk a little bit about the beginning. And event processing architectures is really the early stage of Lambda. In fact, when we launched Lambda in, uh, in 2015, it was from a customer feedback. And some customers were sending a lot of data into S3 storage. Uh, and what they wanted is, uh, uh, what, what they were doing is they were sending data into storage, and then they had uh, crawlers, cron jobs, uh, crawling the data into S3 to see uh, uh, first to do some transforms or verifications of file. And it became quite expensive for them in terms of crawlers, or it was quite difficult to maintain. So they asked us if it would be possible to do some small compute on data that we put into S3. Uh, this is how Lambda was born. Actually, we never expected that it would uh, blow into uh, such a uh, kind of a big service, that what it is, and you know, start the movement of serverless. So really, the first Patterns uh, that came or that were uh, thought about Lambda is the event-driven uh, pattern, which is quite straightforward. It's very natural. It's very human-like pattern. Uh, I'm sure if you have kids uh, in your uh, at home and when you travel, and they would ask you every three minutes, "Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet?" It's not something that would keep you very calm. Event-driven is really in the process uh, of trying to solve it, the kid in the back of the car. And then you really create an action when something's happened, right? So you have an invocation and actions. Uh, and initially, as I say, it was launched for S3, but now it glues together a lot of different services, right? From Cognito, Kinesis, DynamoDB, S3. In fact, every month we're adding more, uh, more and more uh, to it. And you can, of course, create your own custom events, uh, which is uh, pretty cool, so that you can uh, really create architectures inside your accounts, inside of your uh, uh, AWS account, which are really event-driven. And I'll see, I'll show you uh, what kind of things people are doing. Yes, these questions, great. What do you mean by that? So uh, what do you mean by HTML? A webhook or, yeah, absolutely, yeah, of course. You can, you can. Uh, you there's different way of invoking your Lambda functions. E either you create a, a custom event, or you can actually invoke your Lambda function directly as well through uh, an API endpoint, yeah, through API gateway, or directly to Lambda functions. And we'll see a couple of patterns. As I said, this first pattern, this uh, S3, has become so popular uh, that. Customers have started to use it a lot. Uh, this is just a few of those. But it's very simple. You put images or video into S3, and then that triggers an event into a Lambda functions that takes that uh, data and do some transformation, thumbnailing, 
uh, resizing, whatever you want to call, uh, do some AI on top of it. So this is very, really very popular. Uh, and of course, you can uh, the Lambda doesn't just do resize. It can do whatever you want, right? But now there is a problem with this kind of stuff. And I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit later. This actually pattern as well with S3 is very, very useful if you have big data pipelines. So a lot of uh, customers push data into S3. And very often, uh, they tend to trust uh, uh, the source data. right? And you should really always take a defensive approach and never, ever trust your source data. Right? That's the first rule of security, is always verify, never trust. Or you can trust, but verify. Uh, and one beautiful pattern is you know, isolate. So you have an S3 bucket into one account which is your raw data, source raw, which takes all the event. You trigger Lambda functions that does verification, and then verify that the content is, is fit, and then push this into another S3 bucket that might be into another account somewhere. So that way, you kind of isolate uh, the, the content. And this is very, uh, a very, very useful pattern. Uh, and Lambda will scale as, as, the many, uh, data, as many data as you put into S3 there. And then, of course, you can. You don't have to, but you can have a, have a tracking layer here, which will tell you what objects uh, uh, are in your S3 bucket, what they've been doing, and all this kind of stuff. This pattern is also interesting because you can keep the raw uh, data. And what I see a lot of time, especially now that we move into a kind of uh, AI world, is you need raw data, right? And very often, people transform the data and don't keep the raw data. And then it's very difficult actually to come back from transform to raw. Uh, and when you do AI or when you do uh, big data, you kind of need the raw data because you might have an ID in six months and then you see, oh shit, I transformed the data, I cannot go back. So do keep the data, uh, the raw data, and then just put it into uh, a kind of a life cycle policy which you can do with S3, that after, for, for example, 30 days, you move into infrequent access, and then it's half the price already. All right. But as I said, there has been, there's been some, some quite problems with this um, uh, tr event trigger from S3, because people started to have a lot of ideas, right? So they say, OK, we, when we put data into S3, we want to do thumbnailing, we want to do data verification, we want to do conversion, we want to do tons of stuff. And then they needed to build a Lambda function that was coordinating stuff. And that was quite cumbersome, right? So customers came back and, uh, uh, and, and suggested we kind of build something like a state machine, right? And this is exactly what it is. Step, step functions, right? Which is, in a way, a, a state machine that is managed through uh, through API. There's going to be a talk uh, today uh, about this, but it's very simple. Each of those green box are lambda functions, right? Uh, that you stitch together, and you say, "This is my input, and my output triggers another lambda functions." And you can do this visually, so you can actually have very long pipelines. Your pipeline can last almost a year, and you can have also human uh, interventions into it. Right? So you can build very, very complicated pipelines. I've seen pipelines which have over hundreds of different layers, so it's totally possible. And I want to demo this one because uh, I think it's a cool, cool demo. Uh, this is the the architecture of the system. Uh, I'm going to run a, a web app. It's a node, uh, a node uh, app that is running on my laptop. And what it does is simply uh, uploads a function into S3. The fact of uploading something into S3 will trigger a Lambda functions that launch uh, the step functions. And step function pipeline will do exactly what I showed. It'll do some transformation and things like this. And important thing is if you haven't been into the AI track today, there's a service called AI, uh, Amazon Recognition. And what it does is simply takes an image and returns objects and scenes. It does recognition of what's in your image, right? Face facial recognition if there's persons or object scenes and things like this. So you can build pretty cool stuff. Uh, and the project is on uh, AWS Lab, so if, uh, you'll, you'll be able to uh, download it as well yourself. But it works like this. It's quite simple. I've logged in already. I have an image here. But what you can do is you can browse. Uh, you can go into your pictures. And this is the moment where I need to be very careful what picture I upload. <laughs> it's always the, the worst moment, you see. So hopefully I chose the right 
But uh, and what it does, you see now, it just simply uploads the data into S3, and of course, the network is going to be terrible, right? Do we have a network here? Uh, I'm on the Wi-Fi currently, so. Did it? Ah, it worked. It was faster than me. Uh, so the the fact of uploading it to S3 just uh, uh, triggered the state machine. And then the interesting thing is you can query the state machine to know where, where uh, what level it is at every steps. So you can do fairly uh, complicated things. And here you see it uh, resized the, the image and then extracted tags, uh, tags here. So beach, coast, nature, ocean. And of course, extracted the EXIF information as well. So very simple project. Uh, if you're interested in step, step functions, do uh, check the talk at the end of the, uh, the day as well. Then, of course, when you start talking about event-driven, there's a new patterns that come, that and I was talking about trusted verify. This is the operational uh, patterns, right? DevOps have jumped into this because all of a sudden you can make reactive architectures, uh, actually reactive uh, 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 environment. That means that when something happens in your environment, a change happened in your account or something, you can trigger Lambda functions that verifies that. And this, all this kind of stuff that you can do, of course, uh, all the things that you were doing with your cron jobs initially, you can do this now with Lambda because you can hook a Lambda function with CloudWatch event that you schedule. Right? So you replace your cron jobs now with Lambda, and it's actually the same uh, Crohn's uh, uh, patterns that you can use for uh, uh, setting up your, your job. But then you can do uh, quite uh, interesting things. And my favorite is enforce security policies, right? So I have customers, customers like Netflix, uh, for example, they do exactly what I say, trust but verify, is that they allow all the cost of their developers to start things on the uh, on their environment, you know, very flexible. But they have Lambda functions that verify everything which is launched inside their environment, right? So for example, if you, as a developer, launch an EC2 instance, then they have a Lambda function that will verify that the EC2 instance is clear, that is the right one, uh, that is recognized by the organization, that it has the right security patches, the right libraries, or that the security groups are correct, all these kind of things, right? And if it detects something that is wrong, it uh, sends an alarm or actually uh, deletes the resource. Uh, so they're taking a, a quite dramatic approach. So you can do pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff. One of the uh, patterns as well that uh, I've noticed is very important is auto tagging. As a customer, especially in the early days, we launched a lot of stuff to test, and then two weeks after, we were like, what was that? Why did we launch? Why is there EC2 instance? What is the EBS volume? What is this? Uh, who to whom is does this belong? That's simply because most of the time people forget to tag stuff, right? And with Lambda, you can have pipelines that auto-tag resources as they start. So when you log in into your console, uh, you, you, you use your credentials, right? And every one of you that logs in has a, what we call a principal ID. And when you, for example, create a resource or create an EC2 instance, there's a CloudWatch event that triggers that has the object, the event object with your principal ID so that you can take it and then tag the resources that, are, uh, that have been launched. And this is a very good way for your organization to auto-assign uh, departments with the resource that have been started. Right? And of course, it's very important uh, because if there are things that are not tagged, 100% of the time, after two weeks, you'll forget what they are. And then you will be scared to stop them. That's just what it is. And then you'll pay, which is not good. Uh, Capital One has launched an open source project uh, as well called uh, uh, Cloud Custodian. And they do very similar things. So they uh, catch a lot of different events, and then they do auditing uh, on it for policy and compliance. So the Lambda function uh, uh, just acts like a, a police officer to verify that actually everything which is launched or that is being operated inside the account is following the rules because they are very uh, uh, they are under very strict rules. It's a bank running on AWS, and they have. Uh, to comply to a lot of different regulation. And Lambda function is used here to verify those. And then, of course, you can schedule operations. Some customers uh, want to have 
uh, more backups uh, in some regulations. Some bank, for example, insurances might want to have backup more often than the default 15 minute for uh, Redshift, so they can use Lambda functions to trigger every uh, other minute a backup and then move that into S3 in frequent access and then after 30 day or 90 day I delete the backups automatically uh, through a Lambda functions as well, if you want. And then a pattern that is uh, appearing a lot, especially in the media industry, is this one. I've talked about recognition, right? And this uh, Amazon Poly is one of the uh, AI services that we also launch, which is one, call, uh, one line of code. What you can do is transform text into voice. Right? It's a deep learning uh, stuff, so you can create really cool voice. Actually, let's, I'll, I'll just demo it quickly so that you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Is it Polly? <laughs> All right, see here, uh, French Canadian, no, that's not the right place. So you can, oh, there's the voice. Can I have some sound maybe? Internet? Can I have some sound, guys? Maybe a bit? Uh, I know I didn't plan this, but. Text vorlesen, den Sie eingeben. Okay, uh, hopefully you can hear from my speakers. Uh, that's Polly. So what you can do is uh, uh, is is link uh, the similar way link uh, call uh, Polly from Lambda functions. And customers that have websites, media websites, and are using that pattern to uh, create uh, to convert RSS feed into, uh, for example, uh, uh, audio books or uh, you know like audio audio streams or automatically like so the Washington Post for example every time you s it, they write a news article they also call Polly to transform that text into voice so people can listen to the article instead uh, and this is just a pattern like this uh, very simple so this pattern has come a lot then there is uh, one of the patterns that we've open sourced uh, not uh, yeah, that's that you can tune as well for your own account. This is called the Ops Operator, and it allows you to do pretty much all what we discussed a little bit, but you can customize for your own environment. It right? uh, allows you to do, for example, uh, automate tagging for your resources or uh, things like this. Then we move to the uh, kind of web application uh, architecture, and this is also this is something that we didn't. I think of with uh, uh, Lambda, but very uh, very fast when we launch Lambda, people ask, okay, we need an API endpoint so that I can call it, right? And uh, so this whole web application architecture came, and now really the the bread and butter of this application is having an API gateway in front of your uh, Lambda function. And what you can do is you have the Lambda, Lambda pipeline here uh, managing all your custom uh, dynamic resources, uh, so like your business logic, and then everything which is static, so all your uh, libraries, all your video images, and things like this, you would store it into uh, S3 uh, and then have a CloudFront distribution in front of it, so that you can really uh, have a, a serverless pipeline here. Right? And then I have the database used by, for example, DynamoDB. We are also launching Aura serverless, so you'll be able to have relational database here, totally serverless, so it doesn't have to be uh, uh, Dynamo. Uh, Aura serverless is coming this year as well. It's actually in preview. You can already sign in if you want. And when you do this, you there is one service that is super important to remember. It's called Amazon Conito. Uh, how many of you use Conito currently? Uh, right. Yeah, very few people know it, uh, yet is uh, there's a few guys behind. Yeah, it's very, very powerful. And of course, at the beginning, it was maybe not uh, everything that uh, that you wanted. But now we've added a bunch of features that will make it very simple for you to do authentication, right? So you can do uh, 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 you can do authentication uh, through Conito, and it also supports user pools. So if you have millions of users and you want them to authenticate, you can use Conito, and it uses open IDs. Uh, uh, SAML configurations or Twitter, Google, whatever you want to use as authentication. And this, of course, these serverless web apps are have security at every layer. What is very important and I want to point out is on the API Gateway, uh, the usage plan and uh, 
which, which are great. So if you're a customer and you desi decide to create an API and you want to market that API uh, to the world, you can. Uh, there's uh, uh, traditionally on AWS, you would create an AMI and then s uh, put that AMI in the marketplace. Now you can actually expose your API in the marketplace and sell that to a customer. One customer of mine called F-Secure in, uh, in the Nordics uh, went on stage at reInvent and they had, uh, they, they were exposing, uh, selling uh, their API through API Gateway because you can do a usage plan and then you can monetize and we have all the offering there for uh, to help you do that very easily. So very interesting solution if you want to do that. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, that was a weird animation. And of course Conito there. As I said, Conito is great because it supports uh, OpenID and SAML. But uh, if you want to have also uh, a custom authorizer, you can, and Lambda, so in API Gateway, you can create a, a Lambda function that will handle your custom authorizers. So that also means that if you have your authentication inside your on-prem or somewhere else outside the cloud, or, you, know, you can use this uh, through uh, a Lambda uh, function to do custom authorizations on your API Gateway. Okay, so that then you can uh, slowly uh, start using and move some part of your infrastructure to the cloud. And this, this uh, custom authorizer allows you to do two types of, uh, of uh, authorization, token and request base. Yeah. So covering quite a, 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 few, a few things. And Bustle actually move all the infrastructure into this uh, kind of uh, um, architecture, uh, fully serverless, and they've achieved like 84% 80 of cost saving through uh, so moving to that kind of architecture. I always say uh, this kind of architecture, serverless, is great. I, I love them. They are not a hammer. Uh, uh, do not try to move everything to serverless. You need to have the right use case. Right? It's like everything. It's a tool. It's not, uh, uh, it's not the new god. It right? shouldn't be used for everything. But nonetheless, it's very beneficial. Then the interesting part. And this is where uh, data processing uh, comes to place. And there's a tool, uh, a kind of service called Kinesis that is uh, at the base of it. And Kinesis really uh, comes in two flavors. Uh, the first is Kinesis Stream and then Kinesis Firehose. And then in the middle, there is Kinesis Analytics, which allows you to run SQL queries in live on your stream of data. So just to step back a little bit, Kinesis, how this work, because very often, at least when, uh, as a customer, when I was faced with Kinesis, is there is not necessarily easy to understand uh, everything. So I'm trying to to make it simple. A stream is really a stream of data, right? Uh, so there's nothing; it's data moving to the cloud. Now, Kinesis organize the data moving to the clouds in terms of shard. A shard is very similar to so that if you are into the motorway, the autobahn, and then you uh, uh, put the number of cars in the line, your line might take only 100 cars per minute. If you try to put 200 cars per minute, it will be congested and it's not good. So if you want to increase the bandwidth of your autobahn, you create a new line. Right? And a line is a shard in a stream, that's it. And the shard takes one megabyte in write, and you can read two megabytes. Right? And it's simply so that you can read faster than you can write so that you can actually empty it eventually someday <laughs> if it becomes full. And it comes with two things, producers and consumers. Uh, and what you would do is you use something, uh, a tool called the KCL, the Kinesis Client Library, which allows you to send data into Kinesis Stream because what is, you need to manage the shard yourself. And if you don't use the KCL, you need to do it yourself. Where the KCL does it for you, so it will, you just say, give me a new shard, and it does uh, managing the uh, scaling up and down the shards to some extent, right? And still, actually, this is really the do-it-yourself streaming. Allows you to have producers and consumer wherever you want, right? So very customizable, very uh, hands-on stuff. But people were complaining, uh, and by the way, it's sitting on top of three ASIs. But people were complaining that it's still not as easy to use as uh, it could be. So we launched a, a very light version of Kinesis, which still has all the goods, called Firehose. And the Firehose 
hides the all the shards between it, and we take care of scaling that. But the only concern is send data to the stream and then find a place where to deliver. But the catch is we only have three places where you can deliver the data, right? S3, Elasticsearch, and then Redshift, right? So uh, it limits a little bit uh, your actions, but of course you can create producers, your, uh, consumers yourself, but it's not uh, the same thing. Now the, the you can scale this uh, to uh, millions of shards if you wish, right? Uh, but you don't have to manage this yourself. We do it under the hood. So, how many of you have played the game from Supercell? Or Supercell, you know, maybe the company in the Nordics, uh, Clash of Clans, Clash Royale, Heyday, those guys, you've played them, you've seen them on the store to some extent. So, Supercell is one of our customers, it's actually uh, uh, one of the biggest game company in the world. Uh, it's 100 20 people in Helsinki, and they have uh, five games that have been top 10 of the charts for the last four or five years. And they have 100 million concurrent users on their platform per day using their games. Right? Uh, and when they launched uh, Clash Royale, which was the last one, uh, after, uh, after 24 hours, they already had 10 million people using it uh, uh, concurrently, right? so actively. And it's a big stuff. And what they do is they capture game events from their platforms and use those game events to figure out where people are spending time in the game. Uh, if you're in the game and if you're a user uh, and you get stuck into a level, it's very difficult uh, to, for some, at least, or it's always been for me, to keep playing the game if you can't go further, right? So they try to detect that and then adjust the difficulty of their platform through those game events so that people don't get stuck too bad and they can even uh, alter the difficulty of the game. And they do this using Kinesis. In fact, they capture 45 billion events in their games per day. 45 billion. Uh, that's quite ridiculous amount of, of stuff. And they send this through Kinesis to be uh, to be analyzed in real time, and there's a case if you want to uh, read about it. It's interesting on the on the website. But what's uh, uh, also interesting is Netflix. That's very similar uh, to understand uh, how you spend time uh, inside your uh, uh, the the UI. They have something called the SPS, which is the Netflix Pulse, which is how many times users are clicking on play button in their UI. That defines the health of the business. And if they try to catch those events inside the UI uh, to figure out if the application is healthy and uh, uh, in real time. All right. Now let's do uh, a little understanding of how this works. This is kind of a very light version of what they're doing. Uh, and this is what we're going uh, we're gonna to play with you as well. Uh, so we're gonna down, you're going to go online on the website. Uh, connect to uh, an HTML page, which will have Java libraries, JavaScript libraries, and then you will send data into real time into Kinesis. I'll show you every part, how they move. The cool stuff is here, I'm also running uh, uh, Kinesis Analytics, which allows you to run SQL applications in real time in your stream, and I'll show you how it works. So if you can take your phone and go on this uh, URL, and then we'll uh, we'll do some analysis a little bit. Bear in mind that this demo is deployed in US, all right? So and it goes through your cell phone, connects to US Kinesis. Then my laptop also connects to uh, uh, DynamoDB in the US. All right? Once you are there, just let me know. Thumbs up when you see a quadrant with a ball running on your phone. You got it? Come on, come on. Yep. Cool. All right. So this is this is the dashboard that uh, that we're seeing in real time. Uh, do you see it? Yeah. All right, cool. So you see people. We have uh, about 30, 40 people coming here um, using mostly Android here, some iOS, and some others. I'm not sure what others is. Are you? What is it? What is others? <laughs> Oh, uh, this uh, laptop. Yeah, but you don't have the rolling. Uh, but, uh, cool. Good try. Are you moving your screen? Maybe? Cool. 
So just to show you a, a little bit how fast the pipeline goes, let's all go and click on uh, move the ball on A, say A. Uh, and usually after a couple of seconds, you can start to see all the stream already going into A. Uh, so these kind of uh, architectures are really good to understand in real time what is happening in your environment. I've done this demo with 700 people in the room uh, uh, in, in Nordics, and there's no problem, right? The stream, everything scales uh, under the hood. I don't have really to do anything about it. Even DynamoDB is uh, auto-scaling. Kinesis is auto-scaling. So this architecture is good for a uh, few of us to hundreds and thousands and millions. Right. Uh, let's go everything on D as well, just to so that this was not planned. Uh, cool. There's rebellions that stay on B, but there's always those rebellion kids in the room. I know who you are. Randall! <laughs> it's not. All right, go. Um, so how does this work? Right. Yeah, question. Uh, no, so actually some people might uh, lose connection. This is analyzing the stream every second. So every second you might get different data, uh, and I'll show you how it's done. All right, cool. So the first thing when you connect to the, to, uh, to the website, you get the HTML page that gives you some JavaScript. The only purpose of the JavaScript thing is to get sure the position of the ball inside the quadrant and then send the JSON object into the Kinesis stream. And it does that once per second on your device as well. Yeah, does that, uh, so you capture that. And this, this is the first thing that is happening. After that, uh, the, the data is mapped into a different field uh, inside Kinesis Analytics, and I'll show you how it's done. Actually, let me show you directly here. It's much better to. Uh, so this is my Kinesis uh, dashboard demo. As you see, I have my source. The source is the JSON object that you send in the Kinesis stream. And then my destination is the dashboard here. And what I do is uh, I create a, an application called Kinesis application here. All right. Oh, that's great. So what it does is uh, run SQL stem. Do you see behind, or should I put it a bit bigger? This is better like this, right? Cool. Uh, what it does is uh, connect to the stream, and I extract data from the stream. You see here, I extract uh, unique user, uh, Android count, iOS, uh, IoT count. Uh, that's the this destination, right? And the destination is created by taking uh, the user stream, taking the Cognito ID, the device ID, the OS, and the quadrant that your device sends, this JSON object that I show, this one. Uh, this is the J JSON object that is being sent into the stream. And then I replace that, okay, with into my, what we call a pump. So this is my Kinesis stuff. And then what I do, I count the unique users inside the stream. So I count the unique users that have an OS called Android, unique users that have iOS, Windows Phone, and others. And also count the number of A, B, C, A, D quadrant. And this is done per second. Uh, so I run the SQL, the count uh, experiment every second on the stream. And this can, uh, again, scale uh, uh, dramatically, okay? And then this is sent to the destination stream like this uh, in terms of that. So just to show you quickly, uh, my stream is very analogous to a table. You know, the create or replace is, uh, is uh, quite misleading sometimes, but it really represents the data flow. And then your pump is like an insert uh, query. So you pump from somewhere and you put it somewhere and then you do the countings. Now, the when you do the counting, you see uh, the group, uh, the group by floor. There's a couple of things you can do uh, when you do a sliding window. Is either you do a thumbling or a sliding window, and this is the way you're gonna want to uh, calculate how your data moves into the stream, right? Per time interval or constantly reevaluated. And then the output is sent 
into uh, another kinesis stream. As you have you seen, uh, we always take a kinesis stream, do analytics, and then send back to in a kinesis stream and inform of that. Right? So every second, I calculate the unique user counts, unique Android counts, uh, and all that stuff. And then this is pushed by Lambda functions to DynamoDB. And Lambda functions, like every second, they will extract information from the kinesis stream and then push this into DynamoDB, OK? What you need to remember is when you do this is you can have only one Lambda function per shard, right? And then as many shards you're going to have, you're going to have as many Lambda function running every second, taking the uh, number of records that you want. You can take up to 10,000 records at a time, so uh, quite fast. Now, uh, what is important to remember when you do this, uh, if you scale to thousands of Lambda functions, you're going to hit a soft limit. You can only run softly uh, 1,000 concurrent Lambda functions. So if you're going to go above that, you're going to have to raise a ticket and increase your concurrency uh, defaults. All right. But you can, I have customers going, I think, like 60,000 concurrent Lambda functions. And these patterns uh, with firehose is also interesting to do uh, log analytics. Uh, so instead of landing it, l sending the data into a kinesis stream, uh, you would send that to a firehose stream because then you can automatically send the data to uh, an S3 bucket. And then you can use something called Athena. Athena is a, uh, a great service that you can run SQL queries on top of data sitting in S3 without you to having to manage any database. Right? It's running Presto on the hood to run large-scale queries. And it's very good to, uh, uh, to identify uh, uh, your data, see what's uh, in there. And if you're interested, there's, uh, it's pushed into GitHub uh, uh, project there. All right, I'll this is how you uh, set up your Athena. So uh, when you have data sitting into an S3 uh, bucket, you see here I have my data sitting into uh, S3. What I create, I create just an internal, uh, I create an external reference table uh, by just pointing to the type of data I have uh, into my JSON object into S3. You can have JSON object, but it's much more uh, interesting uh, to use Athena if you have Parquet uh, files or columnar uh, kind of files so that you don't have to scan through all the data. If you use JSON, you have you Athena will have to scan through the entire set of data that is inside your S3 bucket. So if you want performance improvement, that is better to use uh, files that are columnar by nature. And this kind of stuff. So what I was doing in my previous, uh, previous role, uh, we had about 150 microservices all over the place. And we wanted to get rid of log files because it was very difficult to manage, and especially log uh, stash, uh, log stash uh, that is often used to uh, send data out of logs. Uh, took a lot of space in terms of memory and CPU inside our instances, and we wanted to get rid of this. So what we said, instead of writing to file, we send everything to Firehose, and then we could use that systems to analyze logs. Actually, the it's but pretty much 10 seconds uh, depend uh, on, on kind of the pipeline to, to, to be able to analyze all the logs. And I, I really like that, uh, that pattern. And of course, Firehose can also send to Elasticsearch. So if you are on Kibana, uh, you can also visualize the data inside Kibana. In fact, the uh, Log2AS, the project that I have on GitHub, does both Athena and, uh, and uh, Elasticsearch. Then the last pattern uh, that is uh, interesting, of course, if, if you want to do some data processing. And this is where we talk about uh, IoT. Uh, IoT uh, is very big for a few reasons. You know, people are collecting data all over the place. Because if you have data, you can make the right business decision. Now the problem is this, the right business decision. Right? You want to be able to make decisions which are relevant for the moment they things are happening. And traditionally, uh, IoT pipelines or uh, stream pipelines uh, were quite long. And now you can have uh, pipelines that actually a few seconds. And I'll do some demos. Now, the first pipeline that is very important is, of course, data collection. Uh, at the heart of this is the uh, IoT, AWS IoT service, which will securely connect one to million devices. 
uh, very easy to use. But the important thing is these things. They have uh, something called IoT rules and action. And these are uh, uh, rules and action that you can implement uh, on, uh, on the system to analyze uh, streams of data coming in real time through your IoT, uh, uh, IoT uh, data collection stream. And then those actions can send uh, uh, records to S3, uh, Firehose, Kinesis. In fact, there's predefined actions. If you use IoT, you can uh, just click an action, and there's a collection of 20 templates that you can do and use for your purpose. And this is really the the uh, bread of butter, bread and butter of combining Kinesis and IoT to do very, very fast IoT uh, pipelines. Um, and you would use this kind of pipelines first to collect data, but then um, down the hood to do predictive maintenance uh, or things like this. And customers uh, in the Nordics like uh, Scania is using similar pipeline to do um, uh, data collection from their trucks. And then they do predictive maintenance to know when their trucks are most likely uh, going to fail. And they want to prevent failure so that the trucks spend most time on the road. And if preventing failure saves a lot of money. Uh, if you break an engine uh, or if you catch an engine before it breaks, it makes a big difference at the end of the year in terms of money. Uh, so these are pipelines are very uh, interesting for that. And anomaly detection, this is also when you want to detect patterns or change of patterns in your sensors. So customers are monitoring, for example, vibration or change of vibrations in, rotor, um, in engines, like big, big uh, wind, uh, wind turbines, and use a lambda uh, to do kind of uh, uh, anomaly detection. Uh. And then you can use interactive serverless uh, application with IoT. So the thing which I, I haven't told yet is IoT uh, supports uh, several type of protocol. MQTT, which is the well, some of the default IoT protocol, very lightweight, but it also supports WebSocket, uh, MQTT over WebSocket. So that means you can have bi-directional connections between your sensors and your applications in the web. And this kind of things you can, uh, very interesting, for example, to doing home automation, right? Uh, so if you want to monitor your home, if you want to control lights in your home, if you want to control the environment, the ACs and things like this. So people have uh, implemented a lot of system using this kind of architecture. And then, of course, you can connect uh, IoT to with uh, Lambda and Alexa to do some kind of very cool uh, talking interfaces. And here you might see something weird. You see a term called IoT Shadow. And the IoT Shadow is uh, a term reserved for IoT applications. Um, when you develop IoT applications in the in the on the web, you never interface your application to the sensors themselves. Because if the sensors lose connectivity, your application is rendered useless. So you always interface your application to what we call an IoT shadow, which is a virtual representation of the device in the cloud. Uh, and what they do, shadows most of the time, do conflict resolution with the device to know which is the last date that they have to be. So that means you can create applications like this one that interacts with device shadow, and then the shadow will synchronize to all the other devices. And it's a very good way to make applications that uh, do not uh, depend on the sensors being online, right? And this, this way you can, uh, you can uh, uh, disturb failure. Any questions regarding this before I go into the demo? Cool. If there are, just, uh, just uh, uh, tell me, right? So go on to this uh, URL. And you should see a light bulb coming into your device. Light bulb, something like that. Cool. And you should see connected to light bulb, right? You see the connected. You got it? Thumbs up when you're connected. Cool. All right, awesome. Uh, so these are this is my web page which is controlling the, the devices. 
as I say, uh, you see it's a bit different here. Actually, I can control. So I am uh, interfacing uh, in the architecture. I am this this one, right? I am interfacing to the, the uh, IoT shadow, and your mobile device are simply listening to updates of the shadow. And then I can do something like this. Uh, updates in real time, the, the properties of the, of the UI. Uh, bear in mind that, again, this is deployed in the US, so it's going through the internet, going to IoT in the US, your phone, goes through the, uh, uh, as well the, uh, the network, and there's latencies there. But it's pretty fast, right? It, it's pretty, uh, pretty damn fast. And as I said, then you can build uh, interfaces with Alexa. I didn't bring my Alexa here, but I have a, an application called Reverb that you can simulate Alexa. So then you can start playing with Alexa and say, you see, I have my Alexa. Silence. Alexa, ask light bulb to set the brightness to 77%. Let's see if we get lucky today. The demo gods in Munich. Ooh, you guys are lucky. <laughs> Alexa, ask light bulb to flash fast. I'm pushing the limit now. Ooh, I'll stop here then. Let's go. So uh, it's very, uh, probably your devices are flashing as well, right? Uh, and again, this is very interesting because, again, I've done that demo with 700 people in the room and everyone was clicking at the same time, pretty much, right? Uh, so you can really scale from one device to millions of devices. And the fun thing is, I don't have to do anything about it. <laughs> I don't have to scale it. It's the beauty of uh, serverless, right? The platform takes care of, ser uh, of scaling that for you and you know, do all the magic for me, right? And this is why I love serverless, right? As I say, it's not the tool to build everything. But there is still some power, right? It's like building Lego together. You know, you don't have to deal with scaling the application. I've done 15 years of my life doing scaling applications, right? And 10 years ago, to scale applications across multi-regions took six months or a year, and you know, five people. Today and in the next sessions or in the afternoon, I'll show you can do this in three clicks, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Uh, if you think about people that are being born now and what they'll see, in f let's say not even born, born 10 years ago and become software uh, developers in five years, they'll never know what a database replication means under the hood. They'll never have to uh, remember what bin log, have uh, bin log replication nightmares, right? They don't. We have to live with this stuff. And this is really why I love uh, serverless applications, right? And if you want to go into more details there, uh, some of the uh, ideas there, the slides will be distributed, so you know, don't worry too much. I'm sure you don't copy the links from your photos. <laughs> I, I do pictures as well, but actually then I realized dude, what the fuck I'm doing with this link. <laughs> All right, and uh, again, if there's more information on the serverless there, I'm happy to answer questions. If you have, uh, catch me here or online or wherever you want. Uh, at lunch or stuff like this. Please do take your bag, as I say. Uh, there apparently, there's some strict <laughs> rules in Munich about bags. So please do that. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Have a good uh, dev day. Thank you.